All right, uh, this will be one one day two. And the big idea that I thought I was going to get to yesterday but ran out of time is the midpoint formula, right out of Algebra 1. So, midpoint formula, we are looking... Oh, I got this zoomed in a little bit much. You've got two points each with their own ordered pair. So x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2. And we want to have a nice easy way to find the coordinates for that midpoint. So that those two segments are congruent. you can stop writing, just look. I want you to come up with a way where hopefully you can remember this without saying, oh, i got to look at my notes to get this formula. Think midpoint, think middle. Think about a number line. Say, so stop writing, just look. Say you were at 1, keep it simple, 1 and 3. 1 and 3. Where's the middle? What can you do with 1 and 3, Adam? You could subtract them. Let's try a different set of numbers and see if it works. Say I am at 1 and 5. Where's my middle here? Where's my midpoint of 1 and 5? Yeah? 3. three. So does subtracting 1 from 5 give us the midpoint of 3? Okay, so we have to come up with something else. Think the middle of two numbers. So I want to come up with 3. Middle. Any guesses? Emma? Yes, yeah, you're going to add those endpoints and divide by 2. So in essence, what are you doing when you add two numbers and divide by 2? What's that called? What are you, what are you doing with those two numbers? You're averaging those two numbers. So if you want to find the middle of two numbers, you're just going to average them together. An average will get you the middle. So think about an ordered pair as two number lines. It's our x-axis number line and our y-axis number line. So to get the midpoint, all we're going to do is average the x's and average the y's. That will give us the midpoint. So hopefully now you can remember that without having to look back at your notes. Okay, midpoint is just an average, middle. So the midpoint average the x's, so that means we're going to add them together and divide by 2. And same thing for the y's, average them together, so add them up, divide by 2. So let's go with straightforward junior high midpoint, and then I'll challenge you after that. Find the midpoint if your endpoints are at 8, negative 4, and negative 9, 6. Go ahead. Crank through it. You do it. I'll do it. We'll compare.
How did that work out for everybody? Okay, they don't get any easier than that. Pretty straightforward. Add them up, divide by two. Now the challenging one. If I give you an endpoint and the midpoint, can you come up with the other endpoint? This is an algebra set up and work backwards. So here we go. So one of the endpoints is going to be at 2, negative 8. The other endpoint, you don't know. That's what I'm going to ask you to find. But I do know the midpoint. The midpoint is at negative 1, negative 3. So it's like having the answer to the question and finding what you started with. That's just an algebra problem setup. So remember, midpoint is just average your x's together. And when I average them together, what's my answer supposed to be? Negative 1. So I'm going to set up an equation that says I'm going to average these two things together. So to average those together, I add them up, 2 plus x. And because I'm averaging, i got to divide by 2. And I'm going to set that equal to the midpoint. Then we'll do the algebra, solve that in a minute. So I'm going to set up the y's too. Because to get this answer of negative 3, it's the average of these two things. So I'm going to average negative 8 and y. So negative 8 plus y divided by 2 because I'm averaging. That has to come out equal to negative 3. Now it's your good algebra skills need to kick in. How are we going to solve this for x? What's going to be our first step? Yes? Multiply both sides by 2. That will eliminate the fraction. Perfect first step. So we're going to times by 2. And you can see it if you put 2 over 1. Times by 2. We'll do it over here too. Times by 2. Times by 2. On the left, the 2's cancel out, and you're left with the numerator, 2 plus x. And you got negative 1 times 2, give us negative 2. And then we'll finish up by subtracting 2. <coughs> negative 2, subtract 2 more, 4. And over here, still timesing by 2, the 2's cancel, eliminating our fraction. So we're left with the negative 8 plus y equals a negative 6. And then just get rid of the negative 8. So the other end point was negative 4, 2. Okay, the next part of the notes, and I just want to show you how big, it's a big table. I mean, it takes me a whole page because I write big. I just want to make sure you've got enough room to fit the whole table on your notes. So if you want to start a new page where you can see how big it is, I mean, it's, I don't know how many lines it's going to take you, but just fair warning, don't want you to have three lines at the bottom and then complain. It's been known to happen. We're going to go over interval notation. Three different, two of these you're familiar with, one is going to be brand new. So there's three, when interval notation is just ways to describe sets of numbers. Like uh, you talk domain and range, how much of the x-axis, how much of the y-axis. There's different ways to describe those sets of numbers, and we're going to go over that right now. Again, because you're going to be seeing it all through the semester. So interval notation. is used to name a set of numbers.
And we've got three kinds of intervals. We're going to have open intervals, half open, and closed intervals. And then the three different ways to describe them. So our table's got to have four columns to it. <coughs> so we've got the interval type. We're going to talk set notation. graphing, and interval notation. Okay. So the first interval type we're going to do is called a closed interval. To be closed, both of the endpoints are included in the set. Both endpoints are included. I'm going to go to the graph first. This is graphing on a number line. So say I wanted to talk about all of the numbers from 1 to 20, including 1 and 20. So you have your number line. You can start it at 1 all the way to 20. Remember the open circles and closed circles back from algebra? When are they open and when are they closed? When should you fill them in and when should you leave them open? Adam, you remember? If it's included. These are included. So for me to graph, and usually I do it right on top of the number line, but I like to go above it. So we're going to have filled in circles at 1 and 20, and then we shade in between. Okay, so you're familiar with graphing numbers sets on a number line. You're also familiar with set notation. Set notation has those goofy brackets that nobody can draw. Where we say we're going to talk about all set of numbers, and you can name the numbers with any letter you want. I'll use all numbers A such that, a little dash, and then we describe this with our inequality symbol. What's true about every one of these numbers? Well, they are all less than or equal to 20 and greater than or equal to 1. Remember writing those triple, I call them triple inequalities. I really don't know what the technical name is, but I'll start it out for you. So we start with our smaller number, negative 1. And because it's included, I use less than or equal to A. And then A is less than or equal to 20. Let me close that off. Remember doing those? Now what's new to you is interval notation. Both of these are okay, but there's a lot of writing there. Math people are no notoriously lazy, so we want a quicker way to do it. So interval notation uses um, brackets. Like we've got filled in circles and open circles. This uses either the squared brackets or parentheses. The squared ones mean that the numbers are included, and the rounded ones, the parentheses, mean that the numbers are not included. So because the circles are filled in, we would use these squared brackets, and all you do is you put the smallest number that where it starts to the largest number that's included and where it ends. So just that little notation means I'm talking about all the numbers starting at 1, including 1, stopping at 20, including 20. That's describing what these two things did. Easy enough? Okay. So that's closed. Now we want to go open. 
the interval. Open interval, neither endpoint is included. So endpoints are not included. Oh, I forgot to go back to this number line. Um, our textbook, this trig book, it's the only book I've seen do it. They don't do the circles on the line. Every other math book out there in the world, I think, does the circles. They will do this. They'll put the squared brackets on the line instead of the circles and then shade in between. <coughs> I forgot about that. So instead of the circles, our textbook is going to use the brackets. But I think nine times out of ten, you'd see the circles. Okay, back to open. Now, open, neither endpoints included. So let's say I am talking about all numbers greater than two, not including two. So all numbers greater than two. How would you graph that on a number line? Numbers greater than two. Adam. Open circle at 2, and then arrow to the right. Okay, there you got your number line. Set notation. Set of all numbers we're going to call G, such that, what's true about all my numbers G? Using your um, inequality symbol. So G greater than 2. Do you want the little bar underneath that? No, you don't. No, you don't. It's not a, well, maybe, maybe not. It's, no, you don't. Because if it's there, what does that mean? It means it's included and I fill it in. I don't want it filled in. So you cannot put the little bar under there like we did here. If the circles are filled in, you have the little equal to. If they're not filled in, you leave it blank. And then you finish it off. So now the new interval notation. Well, I see my smallest number that's not included is 2. So I'm, because it's not included, I'm going to use the parentheses. But what's my biggest number in this set? Adam? It is infinity. We're going all the way to infinity. And infinity will always have a rounded bracket. I want to do one more example in here. Okay, how about everything from negative 10 to 0 and not including them? So everything between negative 10 and 0, not including negative 10 and 0. So that's your open and in between. I think the graphing is obviously the easiest. Set notation. So let's go with um, C's. How do you write this triple inequality? Okay, add one more. Yep, start with your smaller number, then get the right inequality, and it is just a less than C, and then a less than 0. And now for the nice short uh, interval notation. Nothing's included, so use your rounded bracket. Smallest one is negative 10, biggest one is 0. What does that look like? That's the only thing you ever saw. What would you think that was? There was no context to it. Hmm? A point on a graph. 
So you definitely need to have contacts in old, like the domain is this. So now when we talk domain, we're talking sets of numbers. So you've got to have some contacts when it's an open one. Otherwise, it just looks like a, a point, an ordered pair. We're actually, we're talking about a whole set of numbers from negative 10 to 0. Okay, and then our last one is we have open, we have closed. Now we've got the half open intervals. What does it mean to be half open? What else are you? Half, full. half what? Half full, not half full. If you're half open, you're half closed. See, positive, half open. Nice. It's like half full, half empty. So half open, one endpoint is included. Okay, I'm going to give you the set set of all x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 3. Wyman, how do I graph that on a number line? Close circle over negative three, so I'm going to fill that in. Nope because it's greater than, the way this thing points is the way your arrow is going to point. So when I say greater than negative 3, I want where are the bigger numbers? The bigger numbers are to the right. Okay, so that's what we want there. And let's go with uh, Skylar. How am I going to do the, I don't know who Skylar is yet. Where are you at? Oh, got my first absent, Skylar. Absent. Okay, let's go. Let's go, Heidi. Yay. How are we going to do the interval notation for this one? Do you want a rounded one or a squared one? Rounded one. And then? And infinity. And what kind of bracket or brace or what do you want here? Squared or rounded? One thing is wrong there. Cooper, what do you think is wrong with that? It would be the squared one. Why is it squared, Cooper? That's what it means. When it's squared, it's included. When it's a parenthesis, it's not included. So when it's filled in, you need the squared. Oh, I forgot about doing our textbook way. So the textbook would do squared in the arrow. Let's jump back here. Our textbook, instead of the open circles, is going to do the rounded and the shading, just like we've got the rounded there. And then this one would be rounded and arrow. Okay. Now I want to go set of all B such that B is less than or equal to negative 5. Grace, can you tell me how to graph this on a number line? Okay. 
arrow to the left. You can look at the way that's pointing or think less than left. Okay, now the new interval notation. What do you want here? Remember, we've got to start with the smallest number in our set. Yeah. Uh, curve, regular parenthesis. Regular parenthesis. Infinity. Infinity. Uh, negative 5 and a square parenthesis. Negative parenthesis and a square. There is one small thing wrong with that. Adam? It's negative. It is, because infinity is out to the right. That's positive. You need, we need to talk negative infinity. We know exactly which way we're going. So a little negative here, and you're good to go. Nice job. And then our last half open is, which one did I do? That one. Oh, I think we're good. I'm not even going to bother with the last. That's going to that's gonna be it. Okay, moving on. Function values. What example number am I on? Yes. Oh. This one here? Because it's on the 5. The negative 5, whatever bracket this goes with the number next to it. And the 5, negative 5 does have the filled in circle, so it's got to have the um, square bracket. And the smallest number in my set is this number going to negative infinity. So that's why I have to start it with the smallest. So what's farthest to the left is negative infinity. And infinities will always be rounded. Those will never, ever have a square. So negative infinity will always be rounded, and so will positive infinity be rounded. But it stops. My biggest number in this set is negative 5, so I'm stopping at negative 5, and because it's filled in, I have the squared bracket. I'm including it. Did I answer that for you? Yeah. Okay. We're on example 3. We're on example 3. Perfect. So if I give you a function, a nice easy one, if we were to graph that function, what would it look like? You recognize that at all? Yes, Lexi. It would be a line. What do you know about that line? Go ahead. Slope is three, Slope is three and y. very good. Okay. Didn't have to know that. Just checking. So it's so definitely a linear function. And if I ask you to find f of four, what am I asking you to do? So I'm asking you to find the function value at 4. Yeah. Oh, just, put four just put 4 in for x. Plug and chug. 3 times 4 minus 1. We got 11. Okay. What if I ask you to find f of n? What's that asking you to do? Adam? Same thing, Same thing but? Plugging in n. So in place of x, I'm putting an n. 3n minus 1. Can I do anything with that? Nope. And what if I ask you to put in f of g plus 2? Go ahead, Adam. Same thing. You're taking, in place of x, you're putting in the quantity g plus 2. So 3. In place of the x, I'm putting in g plus 2. And then minus 1. Did I do that correctly? Adam? Definitely has to be in parentheses. Now, can I simplify that? Yeah, what are we going to do? What's it called? Distributive property. So we're going to distribute that 3 in and get 3g plus 6. 
and I still have this minus 1, and now it's legal to combine the 6 and the minus 1. Simple algebra 1 stuff. Now I'm going to give you a more complicated function. f of x, 3x squared, minus 2x, plus 1. If you were to graph that, what shape would you see? Adam? Parabola. Parabola. See, Mr. Drew taught you well. That is a parabola. Okay, start easy. f of, let's go negative 3. Go ahead, plug negative 3 in, crank through it, see what you guys get. I guarantee not all 30 of you are going to get the right answer here. It's way too early in the year for everybody to get their algebra right. And especially if you pick up a calculator and do it. Thirty-fourth, most of you. If not, take a look. Okay, we're going to end with the super, super challenging one. F of two a plus four. So again, wherever we see an x, we're going to put in the quantity two a plus four. So it's 3. Substitute in for x, and we're going to square it. So that now becomes 2a plus 4 squared minus 2 times the 2a plus 4 plus 1. Okay, I don't want you to start on your own because about half of you will do this wrong. How do I know this? Because I've been sitting in this chair for a long time. Many of you, I know, don't even lie. If I said, okay, start simplifying this, expand it out, will want to distribute this in. Am I correct? Some of you want to do that? Don't lie. What do I have to do to actually square this quantity here? What? You've got a foil. Because if you've got 2a plus 4 squared, that means... 2a plus 4 times 2a plus 4. Once you see it, you're thinking, oh yeah, that's that FOIL business I've got to do. So we're going to write it down. 3, 2a plus 4 times 2a plus 4. It is illegal, mathematically, to distribute that exponent over an add or a subtract sign. You can't do it. Okay, so we're going to come back and FOIL that in the next line. What do I need to do here? to get rid of my parentheses. Adam. Distribute in a negative 2. So negative 2 times 2a will give us a minus 4a. And then a negative 2 times that 4, minus 8. And the 1's just carrying along for now. Back to this first term. I actually have three things here multiplied. Three times this quantity times this quantity. When you're multiplying three things together, it doesn't matter where you start. You can only multiply two together at a time. Get that answer, then multiply by the third thing. So, you've got options. You can either distribute the three in first and then FOIL, or you can FOIL first and then multiply by three. Both are legal. Both are about the same amount of work. Which one do you want to go with? Adam. All right, so we're going to save the 3. That's going to stay, which means I'm still going to need a parenthesis. 
because the 3 has to get multiplied by the result of this FOIL. So we'll FOIL. 4 a squared outer gives us 8a Eight a, and then sixteen. I think I'll take the time to combine the negative eight and one. So negative four is carrying along. That'll give us a minus seven there. You can distribute, and then combine these two terms, or you can combine and then distribute. I think I want to make that sixteen a. And now distribute. So the 3 is going in. 12a squared. Uh, 3 times 16, let's see, that's going to be 48. A plus 48 minus 4a minus 7. And we're ready to finish it up. 12a squared. Uh, let's see, A's combined, that's a 44, and 41. Okay, so i got to go back and pick up the midpoint stuff that I didn't get to yesterday, which was, we stopped at 42. So we're going to pick up page 11. 50, 52, 54, 55, 57 to 74, skipping, oops, 65 and 66. 